I'm Ike Dave, and on today's Apple Daily, Hyundai and Apple on the brink of a car deal for 2024. Stealth Black AirPods and iPhone SE 3 could be back on the table for April. iPhone 13 to be thicker with slimmer notches. And my Mac Mini M1 is here, so I'll share my first impressions. For the latest Apple news, rumors, and leaks, every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. Thanks, Siri, and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks, and rumors every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and smash that notification bell so that you can join our notification squad by letting me know using that hashtag down in the comments. That way, you will get a shout out in our next video. First up today, could Apple be partnering with Hyundai for the Apple car? So this comes from a report in Korean IT News that says Apple and Hyundai have been in talks about using a factory that's in Georgia, which I believe is currently branded as a Kia factory, to produce the Apple cars, potentially up to 400,000 a year in the USA, starting from 2024. Now that's when the production would be starting. That means it will probably roll out to actual sales in 2025. But there is a huge amount of infrastructure that has to go behind rolling out car sales compared to computers. Now, obviously this can be done, but if, even if you think about people like Tesla, they have had to create retail stores. It's a lot more complex than just having Apple stores because it's very difficult to take your car into the Genius Bar. Now, there's also reports that a beta version of this could be released in 2022. Now, what a beta version of a car means, I do not know, but it makes me think of Tesla's original Roadster, where they took an existing car's shell and they put their technology inside it. So they took a Lotus Elise, I believe it was. Uh, they took out the engine, they put in their electric motors, they put in their technology and called that the original Tesla Roadster. If you've ever wondered what they look like, you can find one uh, just on its way out towards Mars. But in all likelihood, this first Apple car, if there is going to be a beta version, will be very much an existing shell, an existing Hyundai vehicle, or something along those lines, uh, with their drivetrain stripped out, with Apple's own electric drivetrain put in there, if, if they're actually developing their own drivetrain in general. They may just be developing more the technology for the self-driving side of things. Essentially expect a kind of hybrid of whichever car company that Apple does end up partnering with and Apple's technology. Now, I personally thought that BMW was probably going to be the most likely fit for Apple purely because they've done a lot of uh, work with BMW in the past, especially with things like the keyless entry, uh, that BMW was the one that featured at WWDC when that was announced. Uh, but it seems that Hyundai is quite high up on their list, possibly because of those US locations for building. But is an Apple car something you would be interested in? Let me know down in the comments and especially what kind of features you would be excited to see in an Apple branded car black AirPods and iPhone SE 3 set for April. So this is a report from Mac Otakara and it is talking about AirPods Pro 2. However, we have seen reports in the past that the third generation of AirPods is gonna take a lot of design cues from the AirPods Pro, but potentially removing the rubber tips and having an all plastic solid design like the current generation but with those shorter stalks. Now that for me would be borne out by the fact that these are coming in a slightly shorter case, which to me suggests that they are taking those tips off, uh, which suggests to me AirPods Generation 3 rather than AirPods Pro 2. But let me know down in the comments what you think. Now, the interesting thing here, I think, is that we don't know what extra technology is gonna go into these. However, there has been a leak of what appears to be AirPods Pro in black, which would be an interesting development. They have never done the AirPods, the in-ear AirPods at least, in other colors in the past. But we have just had the AirPods Max, which have come out in a bunch of different colors, uh, none of which really look like AirPods. So who knows, we could be seeing space gray or black AirPods in the near future. What other colors? We don't know. And iPhone SE 3, this is one of those rumors that has been on and off and on and off, and nobody kind of seemed to know whether it was really coming or not. The suggestion is that this is gonna be kind of an SE Plus model, so a larger size. So it's a toss up again between the iPhone 8 Plus style design with the 5.5 inch screen and the physical home button for your Touch ID, or going to a 6.1 inch iPhone regular kind of style of design, maybe using the iPhone 11 chassis, but taking out Face ID and replacing that with uh, Touch ID on the sleep wake button. That would be in line with what Apple has done with the latest generation of iPad Airs. And speaking of iPhones, we have got some iPhone 13 leaks. 
Now this is partially by John Prosser, this is partially by some other leakers. I think a lot of it is the same information that's just come out through different mediums. However, the reports indicate, as we've mentioned in the past, that we'll have the same four SKUs, which is the, uh, the iPhone mini, the iPhone nothing, the iPhone Pro and the iPhone Pro Max. Uh, whether these are going to be 12S or 13s, we don't know. My money would be on 13. I think it makes all the sense in the world for Apple to use exactly the same whole number system going forward for all of their product lines rather than doing 12s and S's and things like that. We haven't seen partial product numbers in the Apple Watch. We haven't seen it in the iPads. Uh, not that they really get numbers, but still. And since iPhone 11, we then went straight to iPhone 12. I'm I'm hoping that we'll go straight to iPhone 13. It just makes life much, much simpler. So what is gonna change here? We're gonna keep the same screen sizes. We might be getting that highly anticipated shrunken notch finally. Now, I personally don't care. I didn't think Apple was gonna bother with shrinking it before just getting rid of it entirely when they decide to do that. It looks like there is a possibility that they will move the earpiece up into the bezel of the iPhone, uh, which takes a big chunk of space up in that notch and that will allow Apple to move the other sensors much closer together, giving more space for those ears at the top of the display where we can put more notification stuff like maybe getting the battery percentage back. That would be exciting because that's something that I miss massively. In that gap, you've got an infrared camera, flood illuminator, proximity sensor, front camera, ambient light sensor, and a dot projector. So there is a lot of technology to fit into that little space. So it's important that if Apple does want to shrink it down, they are gonna to have to move something out of the way. And it makes a lot of sense to move the earpiece up into the bezel, especially now that we've got much stronger ceramic shield glass there. And the amount of sensors that live there is exactly the reason why you will not see Apple bringing out phones with hole punch cameras anytime soon if they're also gonna have Face ID. Now, there is a potential that the uh, iPhone SE Plus that we talked about um, just recently could go to a hole punch camera, but I don't feel like Apple would do that. I don't believe they would get rid of the notch on the lower end phone and keep it on the higher end phone, but who knows, Apple moves in mysterious ways. Other potential design changes include a flush camera module, which will not be flush to the back of the phone, but flush within itself. So the, th the lenses, however many lenses go on to next year's camera, will have a kind of single flush piece across the front, which is gonna be potentially sapphire glass as well in order to keep it scratch free. The other potential change that we're hearing is that the iPhone itself could be about a quarter of a millimeter thicker. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but it would be just enough to kind of ruin all the cases that are out there already. Um, but the chances are the camera bump will also change shape and things like that. So it's probably not gonna be an issue, but it would be a little bit annoying if the camera bump stayed the same and all of a sudden all these cases that are out there on the market don't work anymore. Why it's gonna be that, that much thicker, not clear. Um, it could actually make a decent difference to the size of the battery that you can fit inside. I would say it's more likely to be for the Pro models to accommodate the LTPO display panels because maybe they're slightly thicker and that's why it has to expand very slightly. Maybe the lower end phones won't change their thickness, but just the higher end ones. We'll see. And finally, uh, my Mac mini arrived earlier than expected. I was expecting it to arrive today. It actually arrived on Saturday at around lunchtime. So I had a chance to clear out my office, give it a bit of a tidy up. Do let me know if you like this kind of setup with me sitting down in the comments, uh, because things have changed. Uh, the sound might be a little bit different. There are more surfaces around that might be bouncing sound off. So if that is an issue, we will start to address that. But here it is, my Mac mini has arrived, very excited. Um, and I wanted to just give you a quick overview of my first thoughts with it. And it is very much a first thoughts thing. I've spent probably a day using this at the time of recording. First and foremost, which one did I go for? I went for the very base stock model. So this is the eight core, eight core CPU, eight core GPU, uh, eight gigabyte RAM, 256 gigabytes of storage. This is the cheapest one that Apple does, the 699 model which I wanted to see exactly how it's going to perform. Uh, this video should be edited on it. I might use uh, I might use iMovie today. Uh, I might still use Final Cut. I will let you know uh, in the overlay just here which one we ended up using. And first of all, the positives. It is, of course, blazing fast as expected. I haven't heard the fans at all. Um, and I've been doing Blender tests and stuff like that. So in Blender, we did the CPU test. It came out in five... Uh, five minutes and 35 seconds to do the Blender B2 
BMW benchmark, which is one of the kind of standards. And it looks like there's only, like it's up there in Threadripper territory. And this is running through Rosetta. So absolutely incredible performance on that. It was about six minutes 30, I believe, for the GPU version of that. A little bit slower, however, still not a bad performance at all. Again, the fans did not ramp up at all during this, did not hear them a single time. I tried running a couple of games. Uh, Kerbal Space Program through Steam ran absolutely perfectly at 1080p, uh, which is one of the things uh, I'm using a 1080p monitor at the moment and a 1080p TV up here. Those are the two displays that I'm using, one over USB-C and one over HDMI. That is gonna change. Uh, so yeah, Kerbal Space Pro Program ran great. Um, CSGO didn't run great. Um, for some reason, I don't know if this is just a Mac thing, because I've, I've had problems running it on the iMac in the past as well, um, but it wouldn't go properly full screened. It was in a weird kind of window that was just dropping off the bottom. Uh, it was trying to get me to double click on everything instead of single clicking uh, when the game actually started. The actual performance was fine. There was no uh, issues with particularly dropped frames or anything like that, but I was also trying to use uh, HomePod Mini as my speaker for it, and I will come to why that wasn't a great idea in a moment. But in general, for general computing tasks, anything on the web, setting everything up, absolutely great. But there are some disadvantages to this computer as well, which I want to get into. And uh, it's more about the fact that it's a Mac Mini than the fact that it's an M1 Mac Mini specifically. So the first thing is that moving to normal monitors from an iMac sucks because the iMac display, even though this is not even a 5K, this is one of the, uh, I think this was the last model that came with the 2560 by 1440 display. It's just a beautiful display. And going to any monitor, it seems after that, uh, that's not ridiculously expensive, is a less great experience. So I'm using at the minute a 1080p here, uh, which is an HP display. And then up top, this is a secondhand TV that I'm using, but I've managed to get the settings quite nice so it actually looks really quite crisp and it's looking good. So that's fine. I've got a 4K TV uh, that we will be acquiring soon. Um, it's not gonna be a high-end one. I just wanna see what we can do with a 4K display instead of a monitor um, because I think that is gonna give me way more real estate on the screen. Uh, probably gonna run it low scale because it's gonna be probably be a 43 inch display so it's going to be a lot bigger than an iMac that's going to be like a 300 pound tv so a very low priced 4k display it's probably not going to be the most incredible picture in the world but it should work pretty well one of the other things i tried to do was use my homepod mini as the speaker for it and a couple of little quirks with this so number one it won't play system sounds through the homepod mini when that's paired uh wirelessly it plays your system sounds through either the internal uh, speaker in the mac mini itself or it plays them through uh, an hdmi connected tv but it won't play them over the air and i think that is for the second reason which is that there is a delay to it because it's wireless and it's trying to uh, connect to that speaker when you go to play something on youtube you will get a second or two of mouths moving in silence and then the sound will come on the sound is synced perfectly but it's not immediate so that's a bit of an issue and then when we were playing games where obviously it couldn't buffer what was going to be coming up next that two second delay when you pull the trigger means that you see a muzzle flash and then you've got two seconds before before you hear the sound so it makes it very difficult to play games so that's why i've changed my setup and i've gone to using my old harman card and sound sticks which fit nicely with the setup. Uh, the Perspex, the kind of clear um, plastic to them, matches really nicely with the cube that I've got my uh, Mac Mini sitting on top of. Um, the subwoofer is sitting around behind here. Then we've got one of the sound sticks here and one that's kind of out of shot over there. But the sound on these things is amazing. They were designed by Johnny Ive with Harman Kardon, so they have got a lot of Apple heritage to them. Uh, and I managed to pick these up super cheap a few years back. Um, and I think they're just fabulous little speakers. Um, really, really nice. So that's nice. They are now running off the headphone port on it. Um, so that has solved that issue completely. But really, unless you are just having it as a media PC that's going to sit next to a TV and you're going to watch movies on it, I wouldn't 
uh, wirelessly use your sound through HomePods or HomePod Minis. I assume it's going to be the same lag on a regular HomePod. The, the big issue though that I have with this system is kind of the value proposition of this versus the other M1 Max. Because this versus most computers, brilliant value. Um, absolutely great value. But at $699, you cannot really find anything that's this quick. When you compare this to the MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air with M1 as well, um, I'm not sure how it stacks up so well. So what you are losing out on is not just the portability, but you're also losing out on your keyboard, which from Apple is £99. Uh, the Magic Trackpad, which from Apple is £129. A display, which you're going to be spending at least £150. FaceTime camera, so for just the 720p one, uh, you're probably going to be looking at about 40 quid at the moment because of everyone working from home and being on Zoom. Uh, microphones, now you, your FaceTime camera might have one in it, but if you want a half decent mic, um, you're probably going to be spending at least 40 or 50 pounds on that. Uh, reasonable speakers, it has got an internal speaker and whatever TV or monitor you attach to might have speakers. But if you want to get some vaguely decent speakers, you're going to be paying another 50 quid probably. So you're already looking at 500 pounds plus on top of the cost of your mac mini to actually get it to a usable state really and at that point you are getting into macbook pro territory now the macbook pro has got its own display it's got a keyboard it's got its trackpad blah 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 it's also got the battery and the battery life with m1 is one of the big features now i'm not saying that this is not a great computer because it is but some of the big advantages of m1 are not there like the ridiculous battery life that these things get. So yes, it's great because it's low power and it's not consuming a lot of energy, which also means that it doesn't get hot, which means it keeps performing as well as it does for a lot longer. But all of that being said, I'm not sure how great the value is. Once I get a 4K display as well, then we're getting into iMac territory as well. So if I'm paying 300 pounds for a display, this for 699 plus a 300 pound display, you're getting up to a thousand pounds and then you need a keyboard and mouse. And yes, obviously you can get a cheap keyboard and mouse. It's not as great of an experience, but you're getting yourself into a low priced, very capable iMac type device by having this plus a nice display. So that's actually a pretty good value. You do need a keyboard, you do need a mouse, you do need a camera, and then you're kind of okay. But I am interested to see how it pans out in the future. Uh, I'm not saying I'm disappointed in it in any way, shape or form, but it is disappointing going back to a kind of run-of-the-mill display versus a beautiful display on that iMac. Which is giving away what time of night I am filming this. But of course, having this, uh, having this system here now I have had access to the MacBook Air. We unboxed that on the release day because that's my wife's system, but I haven't wanted to kind of get in the way of her use of that. So that's why we haven't had a lot of content on uh, using the M1 MacBook Air. Now I've got this in the office. If you've got anything you want me to test on it, if you've got any projects that you want me to kind of render out in a, a program that I can pick up for, for free and run it to give you a speed test, let me know. Let's talk about it and let's test it on the, on the show. But for now, that's it for today's show. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments. Let me know if you like where I'm sitting instead of standing up over there. Uh, and if you think that's cool, because I've got to be honest, it's more comfortable. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.